From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! The 99 percenters win this round. The New York City government has backed down, will not remove protesters to have the park clean this morning, at least as we go to broadcast. We'll go to Occupy Wall Street encampment for a live update, then the war on terror examined. We have waged war and we are continuing to wage endless war in simplistic terms, domestically against our own Muslim citizens, against others, and against huge swathes of countries. We'll speak with Gareth Pierce, the famed British human rights attorney who's represented a number of Guantanamo prisoners. We'll also speak with the brother of a man facing terrorism charges later this month. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Occupy Wall Street protesters are celebrating in Lower Manhattan today after successfully defying orders to evacuate the encampment they've held for nearly four weeks. New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg had said Zuccotti Park, renamed Liberty Plaza by protesters, would have to be cleared following a request by its owners that it be cleaned. But protesters were also told they'd be barred from returning with the camping gear they've used to occupy the square and around the clock action that's drawn international attention and spark parallel actions nationwide. Thousands of people began congregating in the square earlier today in a show of defiance to the forced evacuation. Hours later, New York City officials announced the request to clear the park had been withdrawn. The decision led to cheers at Liberty Plaza, with protesters chanting their signature rallying cry, We are the 99 percent. Meanwhile, in Denver, dozens of riot police have raided a park near the Colorado State Capitol to break up a protest encampment after activists defied an evacuation order Thursday night. Dozens of protesters have remained near the park and are vowing to return. As the protests spread in the United States, more solidarity actions are planned around the world. Saturday, protesters in cities from London to Auckland, New Zealand, have organized rallies under the banner of October 15. President Obama is vowing to seek new international sanctions on Iran over U.S. allegations the Iranian government plotted to carry out an attack inside the United States. Two alleged operatives were indicted this week on charges they sought to hire a Mexican drug cartel to assassinate the Saudi ambassador. In his first public comments on the charges, Obama pledged to further isolate Iran. What we're going to continue to do is to apply the toughest sanctions and uh, you know, continue to mobilize the international community to make sure that Iran is further and further isolated and that it pays a price for this kind of behavior. Now, we don't take any options off the table in terms of how we operate with Iran, uh, but uh, what you can expect is that uh, we will continue to apply uh, the sorts of pressure that will have a direct impact on uh, the Iranian government until it makes a better choice in terms of how it's going to interact with the rest of the international community. The Obama administration's insisted the plot's legitimate despite widespread doubts. Those involved were easily detectable, and U.S. investigators thought it to be so outlandish they doubted Iranian involvement from the beginning of their probe. Speaking before the Senate Banking Committee, David Cohen, the Treasury Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, said U.S. sanctions could include new measures against Iran's central bank. Options to increase the financial pressure on Iran are on the table, including the possibility of imposing additional sanctions against the CBI. If Iran continues to choose its path of defiance, we will continue to develop new and innovative ways to impose additional costs on Iran. The State Department, meanwhile, has confirmed it's made direct contact with Iran over the allegations. State Department spokesperson Victoria Newland acknowledged that contact had been made, but refused to disclose specifics. We are not 
prepared at the moment to go any further on the question of who spoke to whom and where, but just to confirm that we have had direct contact with Iran. The Obama administration's vowing to approve long-delayed so-called free trade deals with Colombia, Panama and South Korea following congressional approval earlier this week. In a meeting with South Korean President Lee Myung-bak, Vice President Joe Biden urged South Korean lawmakers to ratify the accord. And I know from our discussions today, it is our mutual hope that your National Assembly will ratify it very soon, and this agreement will be recognized by all as a win for both of us and bring, bring the world's first and twelfth largest economies even closer together. Meanwhile, in Colombia, President Juan Manuel Santos has praised U.S. approval of the deal, calling it historic. Critics, though, are warning the trade agreement will undermine Colombian sovereignty and human rights. Colombian Senator Jorge Enrique Robledo said the measure will further concentrate wealth in the hands of the rich. Yo puedo demostrar que esta es la peor decisión que se ha tomado en Colombia en toda la historia de la República. I can say that this is the worst decision Colombia has made in the history of the Republic. It is the worst decision since 1819, when we got independence from Spain, because the free trade agreement is a 1,300-page document drafted in the United States, according to guidelines of American multinational companies that will make Colombia the country the United States wants it to be. The hunger strike against inhumane conditions at California state prisons has reportedly ended after three weeks. Thousands of inmates at Pelican Bay and other state prisons resumed their fast last month to demand swifter action on promises to change conditions and long-term solitary confinement they'd won to end the first hunger strike in July. Among the new promises, prison officials have vowed to review the cases of all prisoners already in isolated units because they've been deemed to have gang ties. Not not because of their behavior behind bars. At least 20 people have been killed in the Syrian government's ongoing crackdown on opposition protesters. The dead reportedly included 10 civilians in the northern town of Benish. The U.N. estimates over 3,000 people have been killed since protests erupted earlier this year. In a statement today, the top U.N. human rights official, Navi Pillay, condemned what she called, quote, the remorseless toll of human lives in Syria, which she said could face, quote, a full-blown civil war. Protests continue in Greece over sweeping austerity measures that have cut jobs, slashed services and raised taxes. A new study, meanwhile, has found the economic crisis in Greece has having a major impact on public health. Researchers at the University of Cambridge say Greece's worsening economic situation has increased depression, suicides, drug abuse and prostitution. Study co-author Alexander Kentikelinis said the figures are shocking. Uh, by the Minister of Health and other officials, uh, quoting a 25 percent rise in suicides in uh, 2010 and a 40 percent rise in suicides in the first half of 2011. Now, this makes quite a shocking—this um, is quite shocking information. Uh, however, we need to relate that to the rapidity of uh, the economic change, essentially the downturn in the economy. Previous studies have shown that uh, the rapidity of economic change does have uh, an adverse effect on uh, public health. Back in the United States, the Republican-controlled House has approved new restrictions on access to abortion. The Protect Life Act would prevent any use of health insurance available under the new health care law for plans involving abortion coverage. The bill would also bar the federal government from denying funding to health care providers that refuse to offer abortions. Critics say the measure would allow providers to refuse abortions even in life-threatening circumstances. Democrats have vowed to block the bill if it comes before the Senate. A billionaire hedge fund manager has been sentenced to 11 years in prison for fraud and conspiracy in the largest insider trading case to come out of the financial crisis, using secretly recorded conversations and the testimony of co-conspirators. Prosecutors argued that Raj Rajaratnam of Galleon Management reaped profits by illegally tipping off associates. Rajaratnam's sentence is one of the longest ever in an insider trading case, but is far lower than expected. 
A former New York Police Department narcotics detective has testified officers commonly planted drugs on innocent people in order to meet arrest quotas. Stephen Anderson made the disclosure at the corruption trial of another officer. Anderson says the practice was so widespread that it came from supervisors or undercovers and even investigators. And the longtime gay rights activist Frank Kameny has died at the age of 86. Kameny was known as one of the leading figures of the gay rights movement. He reportedly coined the slogan, Gay is Good, and his homemade protest signs are now on display at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world.